Lady Molly of Scotland Yard, A Day's Folly. I don't think that anyone ever knew that the real elucidation of the extraordinary mystery known to the newspaper-reading public as the Somersetshire outrage was evolved in my own dear lady's quick, intuitive brain. As a matter of fact, to this day, as far as the public is concerned, the Somersetshire outrage never was properly explained, and it is a very usual thing for those busybodies who are so fond of criticizing the police to point to that case as an instance of remarkable incompetence on the part of our detective department. A young woman named Jane Turner, a visitor at Weston Super Mare, had been discovered one afternoon in a helpless condition, bound and gagged and suffering from terror and inanition, in the bedroom which she occupied in a well-known apartment house of that town. The police had been immediately sent for, and as soon as Miss Turner had recovered, she gave what explanation she could of the mysterious occurrence. She was employed in one of the large drapery shops in Bristol, and was spending her annual holiday at Western Super Mare. Her father was the local butcher at Banwell, a village distant about four miles from Weston, and it appears that somewhere near one o'clock in the afternoon of Friday, the 3rd of September, she was busy in her bedroom putting a few things together in a handbag, preparatory to driving out to Banwell, meaning to pay her parents a weekend visit. There was a knock at her door, and a voice said, "'It's me, Jane. May I come in?' She did not recognize the voice, but somehow thought that it must be that of a friend, so she shouted, "'Come in!' This was all that the poor thing recollected definitely, for the next moment the door was thrown open, someone rushed at her with amazing violence, she heard the crash of a falling table, and felt a blow on the side of her head, whilst a damp handkerchief was pressed to her nose and mouth. Then she remembered nothing more." When she gradually came to her senses, she found herself in the terrible plight in which Mrs. Skeward, her landlady, discovered her twenty-four hours later. When pressed to try and describe her assailant, she said that when the door was thrown open, she thought that she saw an elderly woman in a wide mantle and wearing bonnet and veil, but that, at the same time, she was quite sure, from the strength and brutality of the onslaught, that she was attacked by a man. She had no enemies, and no possessions worth stealing, but her handbag, which, however, only contained a few worthless trifles, had certainly disappeared. The people of the house, on the other hand, could throw but little light on the mystery which surrounded this very extraordinary and seemingly purposeless assault. Mrs. Skeward only remembered that on Friday Miss Turner told her that she was just off to Banwell and would be away for the weekend, but that she wished to keep her room on against her return on the Monday following. That was something about half-past twelve o'clock, at the hour when luncheons were being got ready for the various lodgers. Small wonder, therefore, that no one in the busy apartment house took much count of the fact that Miss Turner was not seen to leave the house after that, and no doubt the wretched girl would have been left for several days in the pitiable condition in which she was ultimately found, but for the fact that Mrs. Skeward happened to be of the usual grasping type common to those of her kind. Weston Supermare was overfull that weekend, and Mrs. Skeward, beset by applicants for accommodation, did not see why she should not let her absent lodger's room for the night or two that the latter happened to be away, and thus get money twice over for it. She conducted a visitor up to Miss Turner's room on the Saturday afternoon, and throwing open the door, which, by the way, was not locked, was horrified to see the poor girl half sitting, half slipping off the chair to which she had been tied with a rope, whilst a woolen shawl was wound round the lower part of her face. As soon as she had released the unfortunate victim, Mrs. Skeward sent for the police, and it was through the intelligent efforts of Detective Parsons, a local man, that a few scraps of very hazy evidence were then and there collected. First there was the question of the elderly female in the wide mantle, spoken of by Jane Turner as her assailant. It seems that someone answering to that description had called on the Friday at about one o'clock and asked to see Miss Turner. The maid who answered the door replied that she thought Miss Turner had gone to Banwell. "'Oh,' said the old dame, "'she won't have started yet. I am Miss Turner's mother, and I was to call for her so that we might drive out together.' "'Then perhaps Miss Turner is still in her room,' suggested the maid. "'Shall I go and see?' "'Don't trouble,' replied the woman. "'I know my way. I'll go myself.' Whereupon the old dame walked past the servant, crossed the hall, and went upstairs. No one saw her come down again but one of the lodgers seems to have heard a knock at Jane Turner's door, and the female voice saying, "'It's me, Jane. May I come in?' What happened subsequently, 
who the mysterious old female was, and how and for what purpose she assaulted Jane Turner and robbed her of a few valueless articles, was the puzzle which faced the police then, and which, so far as the public is concerned, has never been solved. Jane Turner's mother was in bed at the time, suffering from a broken ankle and unable to move. The elderly woman was, therefore, an impostor, and the search for her, though keen and hot enough at the time, I assure you, has remained, in the eyes of the public, absolutely fruitless. But of this more anon. On the actual scene of the crime there was but little to guide subsequent investigation. The rope with which Jane Turner had been pinioned supplied no clue. The wool shawl was Miss Turner's own, snatched up by the miscreant to smother the girl's screams. On the floor was a handkerchief, without initial or laundry mark, which obviously had been saturated with chloroform, and close by a bottle which had contained the anesthetic. A small table was overturned, and the articles which had been resting upon it were lying all around, such as a vase which had held a few flowers, a box of biscuits, and several issues of the West of England Times. And nothing more. The miscreant, having accomplished his fell purpose, succeeded evidently in walking straight out of the house unobserved, his exit being undoubtedly easily managed, owing to it being the busy luncheon hour. Various theories were, of course, put forward by some of our ablest fellows at the yard, the most likely solution being the guilt, or, at least, the complicity of the girl's sweetheart, Arthur Cutbush, a ne'er-do-well, who spent the greater part of his time on racecourses. Inspector Danvers, whom the chief had sent down to assist the local police, declared that Jane Turner herself suspected her sweetheart, and was trying to shield him by stating she possessed nothing of any value, whereas, no doubt, the young blackguard knew that she had some money, and had planned this amazing coup in order to rob her of it. Danvers was quite chagrined when, on investigation, it was proved that Arthur Cutbush had gone to the York races three days before the assault, and never left that city until the Saturday evening, when a telegram from Miss Turner summoned him to Weston. Moreover, the girl did not break off her engagement with young Cutbush, and thus the total absence of motive was a serious bar to the likelihood of the theory. Then it was that the chief sent for Lady Molly. No doubt he began to feel that here, too, was a case where feminine tact, and my lady's own marvellous intuition, might prove more useful than the more approved methods of the sterner sex. "'Of course there is a woman in the case, Mary,' said Lady Molly to me, when she came home from the interview with the chief, although they all pooh-pooh that theory at the yard, and declare that the female voice, to which the only two witnesses we have are prepared to swear, was a disguised one. "'You think, then, that a woman assaulted Jane Turner?' Well, she replied somewhat evasively, if a man assumes a feminine voice, the result is a high-pitched, unnatural treble, and that, I feel convinced, would have struck either the maid or the lodger, or both, as peculiar. This was the train of thought which my dear lady and I were following up, when, with that sudden transition of manner so characteristic of her, she said abruptly to me, Mary, look out a train for Weston super -Mare. We must try to get down there to-night. Chief's orders? I asked. No, mine, she replied laconically. Where's the ABC? Well, we got off that selfsame afternoon, and in the evening we were having dinner at the Grand Hotel, Weston Supermare. My dear lady had been pondering all through the journey, and even now she was singularly silent and absorbed. There was a deep frown between her eyes, and every now and then the luminous dark orbs would suddenly narrow, and the pupils contract as if smitten with a sudden light. I was not a little puzzled as to what was going on in that active brain of hers, but my experience was that silence on my part was the surest card to play. Lady Molly had entered our names in the hotel book as Mrs. Walter Bell and Miss Granard from London, and the day after our arrival there came two heavy parcels for her under that name. She had them taken upstairs to our private sitting-room, and there we undid them together. To my astonishment, they contained stacks of newspapers. As far as I could see at a glance, back numbers of the West of England Times covering a whole year. "'Find and cut out the personal column of every number, Mary,' said Lady Molly to me. "'I'll look through them on my return. I'm going for a walk, and will be home by lunchtime.' I knew, of course, that she was intent on her business, and on that only, and as soon as she had gone out I set myself to the wearisome tasks which she had allotted me. My dear lady was evidently working at a problem in her mind the solution of which he expected to find 
in a back number of the West of England Times. By the time she returned, I had the personal column of some three hundred numbers of the paper neatly filed and docketed for her perusal. She thanked me for my promptitude with one of her charming looks, but said little, if anything, all through luncheon. After that meal she set to work. I could see her studying each scrap of paper minutely, comparing one with the other, arranging them in sets in front of her, and making marginal notes on them all the while. With but a brief interval for tea, she sat at her table for close on four hours, at the end of which she swept all the scraps of paper on one side, with the exception of a few which she kept in her hand. Then she looked up at me, and I sighed with relief. My lady was positively beaming. "'You have found what you wanted?' I asked eagerly. "'What I expected,' she replied. "'May I know?' She spread out the bits of paper before me. There were six altogether, and each of these columns had one paragraph specially marked with a cross. "'Only look at the paragraphs which I have marked,' she said. I did what I was told. But if in my heart I had vaguely hoped that I should then and there be confronted with the solution of the mystery which surrounded the Somersetshire outrage, I was doomed to disappointment. Each of the marked paragraphs in the personal columns bore the initials H.S.H., and their purport was invariably an assignation at one of the small railway stations on the line between Bristol and Weston. I suppose that my bewilderment must have been supremely comical, for my lady's rippling laugh went echoing through the bare, dull hotel sitting-room. "'You don't see it, Mary?' she asked gaily. "'I confess I don't.' I replied, it completely baffles me. And yet, she said more gravely, those few silly paragraphs have given me the clue to the mysterious assault on Jane Turner, which has been puzzling our fellows at the yard for over three weeks. But how, I don't understand. You will, Mary, directly we get back to town. During my morning walk I have learnt all that I want to know, and now these paragraphs have set my mind at rest. The next day we were back in town. Already at Bristol we had bought a London morning paper, which contained in its centre page a short notice under the following startling headlines. The Somersetshire Outrage. Amazing discovery by the police. An unexpected clue. The article went on to say, We are officially informed that the police have recently obtained knowledge of certain facts which establish beyond a doubt the motive of the brutal assault committed on the person of Miss Jane Turner. We are not authorized to say more at present than that certain startling developments are imminent. On the way up my dear lady had initiated me into some of her views with regard to the case itself, which at the chief's desire she had now taken entirely in hand, and also into her immediate plans, of which the above article was merely the preface. She it was who had officially informed the press association, and needless to say the news duly appeared in most of the London and provincial dailies. How unerring was her intuition, and how well thought out her scheme, was proved within the next four-and-twenty hours in our own little flat, when our Emily, looking somewhat important and awed, announced, Her Serene Highness, the Countess of Hohengeberg, H.S.H., the conspicuous initials in the personal columns of the West of England Times. You may imagine how I stared at the exquisite apparition, all lace and chiffon and roses, which the next moment literally swept into our office, past poor, open-mouthed Emily. Had my dear lady taken leave of her senses when she suggested that this beautiful young woman, with the soft, fair hair, with the pleading blue eyes and childlike mouth, had anything to do with a brutal assault on a shop-girl? The young countess shook hands with Lady Molly and with me, and then, with a deep sigh, she sank into the comfortable chair which I was offering her. Speaking throughout with great diffidence, but always in the gentle tones of a child that knows it has been naughty, she began by explaining that she had been to Scotland Yard where a very charming man, the chief, I presume, had been most kind and sent her hither, where he promised her she would find help and consolation in her dreadful, dreadful trouble. Encouraged by Lady Molly, she soon plunged into her narrative, a pathetic tale of her own frivolity and foolishness. She was originally Lady Muriel Wolfe Strogham, daughter of the Duke of Weston, and when scarce out of the schoolroom had met the Grand Duke of starkburg Nauheim who fell in love with her and married her. The union was a morganatic one, the Grand Duke conferring on his English wife the title of the Countess of Ohengeberg and the rank of Serene Highness. It seems that, at first, the marriage was a fairly happy one, 
in spite of the bitter animosity of the mother and sister of the grand duke the dowager grand duchess holding that all english girls were loud and unwomanly and the princess amelie seeing in her brother's marriage a serious bar to the fulfilment of her own highly ambitious matrimonial hopes they can't bear me because i don't knit socks and i don't know how to bake almond cakes said her dear little serene highness looking up with tender appeal at lady molly's grave and beautiful face and they will be so happy to see a real estrangement between my husband and myself it appears that last year while the grand duke was doing his annual cure at marienbad the countess of hohengeberg went to folkestone for the benefit of her little boy's health she stayed at one of the hotels there merely as any english lady of wealth might do with nurses and her own maid of course but without the paraphernalia and nuisance of her usual german retinue whilst there she met an old acquaintance of her father's a mr rumbold who is a rich financier it seems and who at one time moved in the best society but whose reputation had greatly suffered recently owing to a much talked of divorce case which brought his name into unenviable notoriety her serene highness with more mopping of her blue eyes assured lady molly that over at schloss starkburg she did not read the english papers and was therefore quite unaware that mr rumbold who used to be a persona grata in her father's house was no longer a fit and proper acquaintance for her it was a very fine morning she continued with genuine pathos and i was deadly dull at folkestone mr rumbold persuaded me to go with him on a short trip on his yacht we were to cross over to bologna have lunch there and come home in the cool of the evening and of course something occurred to disable the yacht concluded lady molly gravely as the lady herself had paused in her narrative of course whispered the little countess through her tears and of course it was too late to get back by the ordinary afternoon mail-boat that boat had gone an hour before and the next did not leave until the middle of the night so you perforce had to wait then and in the meanwhile you were seen by a girl named jane turner who knew you by sight and who has been blackmailing you ever since how did you guess that ejaculated her highness with a look of such comical bewilderment in her large blue eyes that lady molly and i had perforce to laugh well replied my dear lady after a while resuming her gravity we have a way in our profession of putting two and two together haven't we and in this case it was not very difficult the assignations for secret meetings at out-of-the-way railway stations which were addressed to h s h in the columns of the west of england times recently gave me one clue shall we say the mysterious assault on a young woman whose home was close to those very railway stations as well as to bristol castle your parents residence where you have frequently been staying of late was another piece that fitted in the puzzle whilst the number of copies of the west of england times that were found in that same young woman's room helped to draw my thoughts to her then your visit to me to-day it is very simple you see i suppose so said h s h with a sigh only it is worse even than you suggest for that horrid jane turner to whom i had been ever so kind when i was a girl took a snapshot of me and mr rumbold standing on the steps of hotel des bains at boulogne i saw her doing it and rushed down the steps to stop her she talked quite nicely then hypocritical wretch and said that perhaps the plate would be no good when it was developed and if it were she would destroy it i was not to worry she would contrive to let me know through the agony column of the west of england times which as i was going home to bristol castle to stay with my parents i could see every day but she had no idea i should have minded and all that sort of rigmarole oh she's a wicked girl isn't she to worry me so and once again the lace handkerchief found its way to the most beautiful pair of blue eyes i think i have ever seen i could not help smiling though i was really very sorry for the silly emotional dear little thing and instead of reassurance in the west of england times you found a demand for a secret meeting at a country railway station yes and when i went there terrified lest i should be seen jane turner did not meet me herself her mother came and at once talked of selling the photograph to my husband or to my mother-in-law she said it was worth four thousand pounds to jane and that she had advised her daughter not to sell it to me for less what did you reply that i hadn't got four thousand pounds said the countess ruefully so after a lot of argument it was agreed that i was to pay jane two hundred and fifty pounds a year out of my dress allowance she would keep the negative as security but promised never to let anyone see it 
so long as she got her money regularly. It was also arranged that whenever I stayed with my parents at Bristol Castle, Jane would make appointments to meet me through the columns of the West of England Times, and I was to pay up the installments then, just as she directed. I could have laughed if the whole thing had not been so tragic, for truly the way this silly, harmless little woman had allowed herself to be bullied and blackmailed by a pair of grasping females was beyond belief. "'And this has been going on for over a year?' commented Lady Molly gravely. "'Yes, but I never met Jane Turner again. It was always her mother who came.' "'You knew her mother before that, I presume?' "'Oh, no. I only knew Jane because she had been sewing-maid at the castle some few years ago.' "'I see,' said Lady Molly slowly. "'What was the woman like whom you used to meet at the railway stations, and to whom you paid over Miss Turner's money?' "'Oh, I couldn't tell you what she was like. I never saw her properly.' "'Never saw her properly?' ejaculated Lady Molly, and it seemed to my well-trained ears as if there was a ring of exultation in my dear lady's voice. "'No,' replied the little countess ruefully, "'she always appointed a late hour of the evening, and those little stations on that line are very badly lighted. I had difficulties getting away from home without exciting comment, and used to beg her to let me meet her at a more convenient hour, but she always refused.' Lady Molly remained thoughtful for a while, then she asked abruptly, why don't you prosecute Jane Turner for blackmail? Oh, I dare not! I dare not! ejaculated the little countess, in genuine terror. My husband would never forgive me, and his female relations would do their best afterwards to widen the breach between us. It was because of the article in the London newspaper about the assault on Jane Turner, the talk of a clue and of startling developments, that I got terrified and went to Scotland Yard. Oh, no! No, no! Promise me that my name will be dragged into this case. It would ruin me for ever. She was sobbing now. Her grief and fear were very pathetic to witness, and she moaned through her sobs. Those wicked people know that I daren't risk an exposure, and simply prey on me like vampires because of that. The last time I saw the old woman, I told her that I would confess everything to my husband. I couldn't bear to go on like this. But she only laughed. She knew I should never dare. When was this? asked Lady Molly. "'About three weeks ago, just before Jane Turner was assaulted and robbed of the photographs.' "'How do you know she was robbed of the photographs?' "'She wrote and told me so,' replied the young countess, who seemed strangely awed now by my dear lady's earnest question, and from a dainty reticule she took a piece of paper, which bore traces of many bitter tears on its crumpled surface. This she handed to Lady Molly, who took it from her. It was a typewritten letter, which bore no signature.' Lady Molly perused it in silence first, then read its contents out aloud to me. To H.S.H., the Countess of Hohengenberg. You think I have been worrying you the past twelve months about your adventure with Mr. Rumbold in Bologna. But it was not me. It was one who has power over me, and who knew about the photograph. He made me act as I did. But whilst I kept the photo, you were safe. Now he has assaulted me and nearly killed me, and taken the negative away. I can and will get it out of him again but it will mean a large sum down. Can you manage one thousand pounds? When did you get this? asked Lady Molly. Only a few days ago, replied the Countess. And, oh, I have been enduring agonies of doubt and fear for the past three weeks, for I had heard nothing from Jane since the assault, and I wondered what had happened. You have not sent a reply, I hope? No, I was going to, when I saw the article in the London paper, and the fear that all had been discovered threw me into such a state of agony that I came straight up to town and saw the gentleman at Scotland Yard, who sent me to you. Oh, she entreated again and again, you won't do anything that will cause a scandal. Promise me, promise me. I believe I should commit suicide rather than face it, and I could find a thousand pounds. I don't think you will need to do either, said Lady Molly. Now, may I think over the whole matter quietly to myself, she added, and talk it over with my friend here? I may be able to let you have some good news shortly. She rose, intimating kindly that the interview was over, but it was by no means that yet, for there was still a good deal of entreaty and a great many tears on the one part, and reiterated kind assurances on the other. However, when, some ten minutes later, the dainty clouds of lace and chiffon were finally wafted out of our office, we both felt that the poor, harmless, unutterably foolish little lady looked distinctly consoled and more happy than she had been for the past twelve months. "'Yes, she has been an utter little goose,' Lady Molly was saying to me an hour later, when we were having luncheon. 
but that Jane Turner is a remarkably clever girl. I suppose you think, as I do, that the mysterious elderly female who seems to have impersonated the mother all through was an accomplice of Jane Turner's, and that the assault was a put-up job between them, I said. Inspector Danvers will be delighted, for this theory is a near approach to his own. Hm was all the comment vouchsafed on my remark. I am sure it was Arthur Cutbush, the girl's sweetheart, after all, I retorted hotly, and you'll see that, put to the test of sworn evidence, his alibi at the time of the assault itself won't hold good. Moreover, now, I added triumphantly, we have knowledge which has been lacking all along, the motive. Ah, said my lady, smiling at my enthusiasm, that's how you argue, Mary, is it? Yes, and in my opinion the only question in doubt is whether Arthur Cutbush acted in collusion with Jane Turner or against her. Well, suppose we go and elucidate that point, and some others at once, concluded Lady Molly, as she rose from the table. She decided to return to Bristol that same evening. We were going by the 8.50 p.m., and I was just getting ready, the cab being already at the door, when I was somewhat startled by the sudden appearance into my room of an old lady, very beautifully dressed, with snow-white hair dressed high above a severe, interesting face. A merry, rippling laugh issuing from the wrinkled mouth, and a closer scrutiny on my part, soon revealed the identity of my dear lady, dressed up to look like an extremely dignified grand dame of the old school, whilst a pair of long, old-fashioned earrings gave a curious, foreign look to her whole appearance. I didn't quite see why she chose to arrive at the Grand Hotel Bristol in that particular disguise, nor why she entered our names in the hotel book as Grand Duchess and Princess Amelie von Stockberg from Germany, nor did she tell me anything that evening. But by the next afternoon, when we drove out together in a fly, I was well up in the role which I had to play. My lady had made me dress in a very rich black silk dress of her own, and ordered me to do my hair in a somewhat frumpish fashion, with a parting and a bun at the back. She herself looked more like royalty travelling incognito than ever, and no wonder small children and tradesmen's boys stared open-mouthed when we alighted from our fly outside one of the mean-looking little houses in Bread Street. In answer to our ring, a smutty little servant opened the door, and my lady asked her if Miss Jane Turner lived here, and if she were in. "'Yes, Miss Turner lives here, and it bein' Thursday, and early closin', she's home from business.' "'Then please tell her,' said Lady Molly in her grandest manner, "'that the Dowager Grand Duchess of starkburg Nahem and the Princess Amelie desire to see her.' The poor little maid nearly fell backwards with astonishment. She gasped and agitated, "'Lor!' and then flew down the narrow passage and up the steep staircase, closely followed by my dear lady and myself. On the first-floor landing, the girl, with nervous haste, knocked at a door, opened it, and muttered half-audibly, "'Ladies, to see you, miss!' Then she fled incontinently upstairs. I have never been able to decide whether that little girl thought that we were lunatics, ghosts, or criminals. But already Lady Molly had sailed into the room, where Miss Jane Turner apparently had been sitting reading a novel. She jumped up when we entered and stared open-eyed at the gorgeous apparitions. She was not a bad-looking girl, but for the provoking, bold look in her black eyes, and the general slatternly appearance of her person. "'Pray do not disturb yourself, Miss Turner,' said Lady Molly in broken English, as she sank into a chair, and beckoned me to do likewise. "'Pray sit down. I will be brief. You have a compromising photograph, is it not?' of my daughter-in-law, the Countess of Hohengeberg. I am the Grand Duchess of starkburg Nurheim. This is my daughter, the Princess Amelie. We are here incognito. You understand? Not? And with inimitable elegance of gesture, my dear lady raised a pair of starers to her eyes and fixed them on Jane Turner's quaking figure. Never had I seen suspicion, nay terror, depicted so plainly on a young face. But I will do the girl the justice to state that she pulled herself together with marvellous strength of will. She fought down her awed respect of this great lady, or rather, shall I say, that the British middle-class want of respect for social superiority, especially if it be foreign, now stood her in good stead. "'I don't know what you're talking about,' she said with an arrogant toss of the head. "'That is a lie, is it not?' rejoined Lady Molly calmly, as she drew from her reticule the typewritten letter which Jane Turner had sent to the Countess of Hohengeberg. This you wrote to my daughter-in-law. The letter reached me instead of her. It interests me much. 
I will give you two thousand pounds for the photograph of her and Mr. Uh, Rumbold. You will sell it to me for that, is it not? The production of the letter had somewhat cowed Jane's bold spirit, but she was still defiant. I haven't got the photograph here, she said. Ah, no, but you will get it, yes, said my lady, quietly replacing the letter in her reticule. In the letter you offer to get it for thousand pound. I will give you two thousand. Today is a holiday for you. You will get the photograph from the gentleman, not, and I will wait here till you come back. Whereupon she arranged her skirts round her and folded her hands placidly, like one prepared to wait. I haven't got the photograph, said Jane Turner doggedly, and I can't get it today. The the person who has it doesn't live in Bristol. No, ah, but quite close, isn't it? rejoined my lady placidly. I can wait all the day. No, you shan't, returned Jane Turner whose voice now shook with obvious rage or fear, I knew not which. I can't get the photograph today, so there. And I won't sell it to you. I won't. I don't want your two thousand pounds. How do I know you're not an impostor? From this, my good girl, said Lady Molly quietly, that if I leave this room without the photograph, I go straight to the police with this letter, and you shall be prosecuted by the Grand Duke, my son, for blackmailing his wife. You see, I am not like my daughter-in-law. I am not afraid of a scandal, so you will fetch the photograph, isn't it? I and the Princess Amelie will wait for it here. That is your bedroom, not? she added, pointing to a door which obviously gave on an inner room. Will you put on your hat and go at once, please? Two thousand pound or two years in prison. You have the choice, isn't it? Jane Turner tried to keep up her air of defiance, looking Lady Molly full in the face, but I who watched her could see the boldness in her eyes gradually giving place to fear and then to terror, and even despair. The girl's face seemed literally to grow old as I looked at it, pale, haggard, and drawn, whilst Lady Molly kept her stern, luminous eyes fixed steadily upon her. Then, with a curious, wild gesture, which somehow filled me with a nameless fear, Jane Turner turned on her heel and ran into the inner room. There followed a moment of silence. To me it was tense and agonizing. I was straining my ears to hear what was going on in that inner room. That my dear lady was not as callous as she wished to appear was shown by the strange look of expectancy in her beautiful eyes. The minutes sped on. How many I could not afterwards have said. I was conscious of a clock ticking monotonously over the shabby mantelpiece, of an errand boy outside shouting at the top of his voice, of the measured step of the cab horse, which had brought us hither, being walked up and down the street. Then suddenly there was a violent crash, as of heavy furniture being thrown down. I could not suppress a scream, for my nerves by now were terribly on the jar. "'Quick, Mary, the inner room,' said Lady Molly. "'I thought the girl might do that.' I dared not pause in order to ask what that meant, but flew to the door. It was locked. "'Downstairs, quick,' commanded my lady. "'I ordered Danvers to be on the watch outside.' "'You may imagine how I flew,' and how I blessed my dear lady's forethought in the midst of her daring plan, when, having literally torn open the front door, I saw Inspector Danvers in plain clothes, calmly patrolling the street. I beckoned to him. He was keeping a sharp lookout, and together we ran back into the house. Fortunately, the landlady and the servant were busy in the basement, and had neither heard the crash nor seen me run in search of Danvers. My dear lady was still alone in the dingy parlour, stooping against the door of the inner room, her ear glued to the keyhole. "'Not too late, I think,' she whispered hurriedly. "'Break it open, Danvers.' Danvers, who was a great strong man, soon put his shoulder to the rickety door, which yielded to the first blow. The sight which greeted us filled me with horror, for I had never seen such a tragedy before. The wretched girl, Jane Turner, had tied a rope to a ring in the ceiling, which I suppose at one time held a hanging lamp, the other end of that rope she had formed into a slip-noose and passed round her neck. She had apparently climbed onto a table, and then used her best efforts to end her life by kicking the table away from under her. This was the crash which we had heard, and which had caused us to come to her rescue. Fortunately, her feet had caught in the back of a chair close by. The slip-noose was strangling her, and her face was awful to behold, but she was not dead. Danvers soon got her down. He is a first-aid man, and has done these terrible jobs before. As soon as the girl had partially recovered, Lady Molly sent him and me out of the room. In the dark and dusty parlour, 
where but a few moments ago I had played my small part in a grim comedy, I now waited to hear what the sequel to it would be. Danvers had been gone some time, and the shades of evening were drawing in. Outside, the mean-looking street looked particularly dreary. It was close on six o'clock, when at last I heard the welcome rustle of silks, the opening of a door, and at last my dear lady, looking grave but serene, came out of the inner room, and beckoning to me, without a word, led the way out of the house and into the fly, which was still waiting at the door. "'We'll send the doctor to her,' were her first words as soon as we were clear of Bread Street. "'But she is quite all right now, save that she wants a sleeping draught. "'Well, she has been punished enough, I think. "'She won't try her hand at blackmailing again.' "'Then the photograph never existed?' I asked, amazed. "'No, the plate was a failure, "'but Jane Turner would not thus readily give up the idea "'of getting money out of the poor, pusillanimous countess. "'We know how she succeeded in terrorizing that silly little woman. "'It is wonderful. "'How cleverly a girl like that worked out such a complicated scheme all alone.' "'All alone?' "'Yes, there was no one else. "'She was the elderly woman who used to meet the countess "'and who rang at the front door of the Weston apartment house. "'She arranged the whole of the mise-en-scene "'of the assault on herself all alone "'and took everybody in with it. "'It was so perfectly done. "'She planned and executed it "'because she was afraid that the little countess "'would be goaded into confessing her folly to her husband "'or to her parents, "'when a prosecution for blackmail would inevitably follow. "'So she risked everything on a big coup, and almost succeeded in getting a thousand pounds from Her Serene Highness, meaning to reassure her, as soon as she had the money, by the statement that the negative in prints had been destroyed. But the appearance of the Grand Duchess of starkburg norheim this afternoon frightened her into an act of despair. Confronted with the prosecution she dreaded, and with the prison she dared not face, she, in a mad moment, attempted to take her life. I suppose now the whole matter will be hushed up, Yes, replied Lady Molly with a wistful sigh, the public will never know who assaulted Jane Turner. She was naturally a little regretful at that, but it was a joy to see her, the day when she was able to assure Her Serene Highness, the Countess of Hohengeberg, that she need never again fear the consequences of that fatal day's folly. End of A Day's Folly, 